You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show, rated the number one podcast of all time. Of all time. Oh. Make sure you're ready, because this is the podcast where you are guaranteed to learn virtually everything. Well, today's podcast is brought to you by Audible, an outstanding company. They've got over 150,000 titles to choose from. I'm a huge believer in reading, as you can imagine, since we always interview uh, authors and whatnot. Most of those books are available on Audible. And, you know, you travel, you're in your car, there's no excuse not to get a book listened to. I think it's a better way to do it than read. I really do. Um, I, I, I'm, I've been using Audible forever. And guess what? If you go to audiblepodcast.com slash BCS, as in the Brian Callen Show, well, you get a free download. Um, so use it. Uh, it's a funny thing about being uh, sponsored. Um, you know, I've always kind of said I'm only going to do things that I believe in. I don't, and, and, and I believe in Audible as a company. I think it's excellent. I think they do a service to all of us. So life is too short not to read. And it's certainly too short not to listen to books. And by the way, you know, it has over a thousand science and technology um, books and over 1,100 science fiction and fantasy titles. Okay. So there you go. And more stuff being added all the time. So once again, go to, uh, go to audiblepodcast.com slash BCS, The Brian Callen Show, for your free download. All right, everybody, this is The Brian Callen Show. Um, and before I even start, I should tell you, um, I know we have a lot to talk about because we, we had uh, Larry Flint on this particular podcast, but I'm going to be in Raleigh, North Carolina <laughs> at good night, September 12th, 13th, and 14th. If you like to laugh, if you like to learn, if you like to get crazy, come see the kid. I'll be there. <laughs> In a pair of tight jeans, just brought, bought a pair of rubber jeans and some high-heeled sneakers, and I can't wait to show them off. I've also been working on my hamstring flexibility. I'll be doing some high kicks. <laughs> anyway, uh, I am joined by uh, our producer, Mike Casentini, who was also in the, in, in the room. I could not make it. I was uh, doing uh, um, Kirstie Alley's sh- uh, new show, and uh, unfortunately, and much to my chagrin, I had to sit on a, on a lot in Hollywood while you, Hunter Mott, <laughs> and Mike Casentini got to go into what I hear is a spectacular office, an oval office, and interview the man, the myth, the legend, Larry Flint. Um, and I, I listened to the interview, and it was you did a great job, great questions, and it was fascinating. Um, and he is an impor- a very important American figure. Absolutely. I mean, you know... His office, I mean, there's in one corner of his office, there's this display case, right? And it's a trophy case. And within that, there's a mixture of various awards from very prestigious organizations for his work with the First Amendment. But also on the bottom level is an AVN award for best girl on girl action, yeah. you know, 2000, whatever. Um, but that is that is part and parcel. That is part of what you have to at least tolerate. And he absolutely. uses the word toleration in this. When, if you live in a free society, and and, that's, and I loved what he, yeah. the way he couched it, he said, "You've got to, you've got to." And we're going to listen to the interview in a second here, but you've got to be able to tolerate people you don't agree with mm-hmm. in a free society if the if the uh, First Amendment is worth anything. And uh, so, what, what's interesting is that um, he's lived a life seven years old, and he An has much to say. Life. He has much to say, and I I believe that he is an important example, an important profile, whether or not you agree with him um, and what he does, he's, he, he has a role to play, he's got a lot to say, and um, I would argue in many ways he's, uh, he speaks wisdom when it comes to the First Amendment and what he has to say is important. All right, um, should we kick it off? Go for it. Here it is. You ready, Mr. Flint? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, boys and girls, guys and gals, it is a real pleasure today because on the Brian Callen Show, I am currently sitting in Larry Flint's office on the 10th floor uh, overlooking pretty much all of Los Angeles. And we're going to be asking Mr. Flint some questions about everything from the First Amendment to sex. Um, So the first thing is, Mr. Flint, uh, how did you become interested in the First Amendment? Oh... Like everybody else, I think I always took it for granted. I had to stand in the courtroom and listen to the judge sentence me to 25 years in prison before I realized 
uh, that free speech could not be taken for granted. So I became embroiled very early on in uh, all the First Amendment issues, and I spent 20 years of my life in the 70s and the 80s putting out brush fires all over the country uh, where they were wanting to put people in jail for what kind of book they published or what kind of movie they made. And, you know, obviously you've made a tremendous personal sacrifice in that quest, right? You were shot. Um, and, you know, to, to what degree did that intensify your interest in the First Amendment? Did that change? No, that didn't change me. If anything, it made me more determined. Mm-hmm. Um, at, the, at the same time, I was limited physically. I was determined about being vocal about uh, the issues of free speech and how important they were to the whole country. I think I fought a lot harder than I would have had I never been shot. And, uh, you know, I think everybody who listens to this show is a huge fan of The People vs. Larry Flint. I mean, it was a really, really great movie. Um, What did you think of that movie? Well, it's embarrassingly true. (laughs) I was definitely one of those wild and crazy guys back then. But uh, I thought Woody Harrelson played me better than I play myself. (laughs) It it, it was terrific. He did did a very good job. But for the most part, the movie was... uh, the movie was true. I, I think it was important. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously the First Amendment is very much in the news again today with what's been happening with Edward Snowden um, and what's been happening with Bradley Manning. Um, do you think that the First Amendment is more under threat today than it was 20, 30 years ago? Or, you know, does the struggle continue just at the same level? Uh, definitely, it's uh, it's definitely under siege. But what people don't understand is that free speech is only important if it's offensive. Mm-hmm. If you're not going to offend anyone, you don't need protection of the First <laughs> Amendment. And that's what uh, Snowden and Bradley did. They defended a lot of people. <laughs> but um, I, I have a little bit of a problem on the issue that I'm sure that our government has a lot of secret plans, such as how they keep track of Al Qaeda and how they're trying to prevent other tourist tourists attract or terrorists attacks from coming to the to the country. I don't think that sort of information should be released. Mm-hmm. As well as I don't think that you release information on how to build a nuclear bomb, mm-hmm. even if you have it. Mm-hmm. You know? So what our government has failed to do, and it's not, this isn't Snowden's fault, mm-hmm. uh, right? Nobody else's, no, no other was of ours fault. It's the government's fault for not having the proper oversight and for overreaching mm-hmm. in terms of the information that they're gathering from individual citizens. See, the government is such a bureaucracy that if you if you leave them alone without clear guidelines, without somebody to police them, <laughs> they're going to get out of control, and they, they're going to screw things up. They're going to violate their civil liberties, and they're going to continue to violate them. So, uh, Obama and the senators up there, they're all going to have to eat a little crow, you know? <laughs> they're going to they're gonna have to say, hey... You know, we were wrong. You know, let, 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 let's back off and let's do this thing again and get it right. Well, uh, you know, you're you're the author of three books, and the the sort of recurring 
five books now, five books. But the recurring theme of a lot of these books is uh, political hypocrisy, right? In particular, your most recent book, One Nation Under Sex. Um, which w would you be? Would you tell us a little bit about that? Well, One Nation Under Sex is a, a review of the uh, first ladies of the of the country and how their sex life with their husband affected policy and and. Uh, and really even foreign affairs in many cases like that. So no one had ever written a book like that for, for they had focused on what contribution did the first did the first lady make? And I'm not talking about how to grow a garden on a white house lawn. <laughs> you know. But I'm talking about, or, or I'm not talking about even Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, you know, magnificent contribution to to the social welfare. But I'm talking about how did the sex lives of these individuals, how did they change the course of history? Mm hmm and you had some presidents where there were more than one relationship. Roosevelt had four different relationships when he was in the White House. There's not enough medical information available to know whether these were actually sexual relationships or if they were strictly platonic. But it doesn't matter. Many historians have recognized the fact that it was these strong women mm -hmm. like Lucy Mercer that helped Roosevelt get through the Depression and through World War II because they took care of him. Mm -hmm. you know, he was in a wheelchair. They brought him his martini every night. They put him to bed. They got him up for the day, and you know, and he loved these women. She had no relationship with Eleanor after she had thought him with her social secretary, like in 1919. He, she, she never shared a bed with him after that. Now, uh, you know, in the United States, we have this very weird relationship with sex. Like, obviously, sex is necessary for the survival of the species, but, you know, we're not very open about it, especially in our political life, right? You know, and a large part of that is religion. So what are your thoughts on religion? Do you think that religion is important? Do you think religion is an obstacle to the sort of society we want to create? Well, the problem with, the problem with America is... We've got a knee-jerk attitude towards sex, anything about sex. Mm -hmm. In Europe, you find people are much more laid back on the question of sex. But it's easy for me to see why sex is such a political buzzword, because the church has had its hand on our crotch for over 2,000 years, <laughs> you know, and the government is exceedingly moving in that direction, figuring if they can control you, they can, or they can control your pleasure center, uh -huh. they can control you. And uh, it's basically a, uh, a control mechanism, but... You see, back in the 18th century, the rich and the privileged, they always had their leather-bound editions of erotic pornography, mm -hmm. okay? But uh, today, you know, the book, adult bookstore is the poor man's art museum. All that's gone, mm -hmm. you know? The genie's out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all know that uh, the emperor has no clothes, and... <laughs> <laughs> Everybody enjoys sex. So right. uh, the thing that I've never been able to quite understand is other than the desire for survival, the strongest single desire that we have is that for sex. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, you wonder... Well, the one medium that we use to communicate with more than anything else you think we'd make an effort to learn a little bit more about it. <laughs> People don't know anything about sex. Mm -hmm. And you're here to educate them. Yeah. 
It's a, a psychological and physiological phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you don't need much practice to get it right. But it's <laughs> that, uh, as Woody Allen says, the problem is it's three minutes of sex and three hours of guilt. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's wrong with sex. It should be... It should be uh, the other way around. Three hours of sex and three seconds of guilt. <laughs> um, so if, 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 you know, we have a lot of people who are very young who listen to this podcast. So if you were to tell them, you know, what they need to be doing for the First Amendment, you said that unless you're offending people, you're not doing the First Amendment the right way, essentially, right? Right, you want? You said that as uh, that if... If, pe if you're not offending people, then you're not really using the First Amendment, right? Is that fair? Uh, uh, yes, that, that, that's fair. Because, you know, the, the famous court case that I took before the Supreme Court and won against the Reverend Jerry Falwell, where they awarded him damages against me for intentional infliction of emotional distress... <laughs> <laughs> Not because of libel. They wanted me to give him money because I hurt his feelings. <laughs> you got to understand, these cartoon, uh, these cartoonists and these uh, editorialists and even a lot of these talk show hosts, they say certain things. They want to upset people. They want to offend people. They want to shake things up. And... It's the powers of be that, that decry the fact that we, we even want to claim that we have a First Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a segment of society out there that thinks that uh, we should not have that First Amendment. Mm -hmm. And what is that segment of society? It's the powers that be, the politicians, the big business, the religious leaders? The, the tea baggers, the conservatives, you know, they're all from the same mold, mm -hmm. you know. And that mold is? They're, they're arch conservatives, and they have no, they have no toleration, you see. In order to live in a free society, you have to tolerate certain things that you don't necessarily like so you mm -hmm. can be free. Mm-hmm. I can't tolerate Fox News anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is, but uh, you see, beggars, they got no sense of humor. They don't want to tolerate anything. <laughs> so should we send a letter to Sarah Palin saying, listen, Larry's willing to tolerate you. Mr. Flint is willing to tolerate you. You should be willing to tolerate him in return. Yeah, I, I won't waste my breath on her. <laughs> Dumber than sand. So, um, as you look back uh, over your career, right? You know, you've got you've taken a case to the Supreme Court. You fought for the First Amendment all over this country, um, and you've also published, you know, a series of pornographic magazines, right? How do those ac accomplishments stack up in your mind? Of which are you mo the most proud? Do you think that they're all part of the same First Amendment fight? I think so, uh, but I, I'm the first to admit in the beginning, you know, the only thing I want to do is make money and have fun. I did a lot of that, too, yeah. you know. I mean, uh, uh, getting involved in the First Amendment and uh, the free speech fights where it just, it just came along with the territory. Mm-hmm. And uh, in general, as you look at, you know, our union, as you look at American politics today, how, how healthy or how sick do you think this country is? You know, a great Russian czar Lenin once said the problem with democracy is it will destroy itself from within. Now take a look at our political system, our judicial system, all the gridlock that we have, mm -hmm. nothing can be accomplished. Everything that he's saying is coming to pass. 
And obviously, there's some to some degree that's the failure of the people on top, the powers that be. But to what extent are the people, the voters, failing in their responsibilities to this democracy? Oh, voter apathy is to blame for all of it. I have very little sympathy when people complain about not having a job or complaining about the system or uh, complaining about all the issues that. Uh, and affect people's everyday lives because if you vote every election time to turn those bastards out of office that aren't doing anything for you after doing that for a few times they're going to get the picture Mm -hmm. they're going to realize that if they want to stay in Congress if they want to stay in the Senate that they're going to have to be responsive to the American people but nothing is going to change the system short of that and do you feel there's a real difference, though, today between the Republicans and the Democrats, or are they very much the same? Well, you know, I I really don't feel comfortable saying this, but it's true. I have never met a Republican conservative at his heart was not a racist. And these guys are just bigots, Mm -hmm. you know. And at least with the liberals, you know, you know where you stand. I got a lot of problems with various liberal philosophy because they're not as physical responsible as they should be. But, you know, but... uh, the Republican, conservative Republicans are horrifying. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have nothing in common with them. I, uh, uh, I avoid them whenever a chance I get. <laughs> <laughs> so, would you say then that personally you're fiscally conservative but socially liberal? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I think that's that's part of the problem is is that I think you know I certainly that's how I identify. I would say if anything I'm a Rockefeller Republican, but you know Rockefeller was a long time ago, and there there isn't really a candidate out there. Well, Rockefeller would be a Democrat today. He if would, he yeah. Alive, so. um, but I, I but you know for if if you are a fiscal conservative and a social liberal, there's not really an option on the ballot for you. So even in, if you were to turn the bastards out every four years, who you have to vote for someone, and there's not a good option currently. Well, what you do in that case is you vote for the lesser of the two evils. Mm-hmm. I think that's what most people are already doing. No, I don't. No, I I think they they have a tendency to vote the party line uh-huh. in most cases. Uh-huh. So, you know, uh, dad and grandpa's politics are not necessarily the same as yours. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. Uh-huh. So, do you think the revolution is going to have to the change in our society, the change in our you know restoring our union is going to have to come from below? Yeah, I thought Obama was really on to something when it was the youth vote. I, it seems to be slipping away. It's not 100% Obama's fault because the Republicans have been such obstructionists, you know. Mm-hmm. they Everything that he's wanted to do to try and help the country, they've obstructed him. And we, of course, we have three branches of government, the city, uh, uh, the Senate, the uh, House and uh, the presidency. And unless you have majorities in all three houses, you can't necessarily do anything you want to do. Well, and you can't really do much today in politics without a lot of money. Uh, what are your thoughts on campaign finance? I, I think that, that we will be better off and actually ahead financially if the government financed all the campaigns Mm -hmm. you would take and allow so much money for every senate race and you were whoever got the presidential nomination you would allow 
certain amount of money, and that will be all they could spend. So then, what you would get is it, it, it will boil down to who had the most creative staff working for him. Who was best on social media? Who was best on developing the ad campaigns and all that stuff, you know? But but nobody would have a real cash advantage over the other person. But but the smartest one would probably wind up getting all that cash. And presumably the smartest one, the most ingenious one, the one who's best able to use whatever resources are available is the one who you want in office anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd at least be selecting on the right criteria rather than on your willingness to kiss ass and tell, you know, your donors whatever they want to hear. Right. Yeah. I mean, do you, what, what, what are your plans from here? You know, you've already, you've done so much with the First Amendment. You know, you've had a, of an incredibly varied career. Um, you know, where does the fight go next for you? Well, I don't look at it as a fight. I've been very fortunate. I've made a lot of money in my life. Mm-hmm. And today I'm making more money than I ever made before. So, but I'm 70 years old, see, so I'm just trying to, uh, I'm just trying to hang on long enough to spend it because there's <laughs> nobody I really want to leave it to. <laughs> so <laughs> if you if you've got as much money as you do and you need to spend it really fast, how do you spend that money really really fast? I go anywhere in the world I want. I got my own private jet. But do you, I mean, I, you know, you're famous for having gold-plated your wheelchair. Do you need to go on a gold-plating spree and just start gold-plating everything in your life? <laughs> no, I'm, uh, my plan's largely gold-plated, yeah. <laughs> um, is, uh, you know, um, how, I, I know some people feel guilty about making money, right? That sort of Catholic guilt about having a lot of money and all that sort of stuff. What do you think about being guilty about making money? I uh, have no guilt there at all. You know, there's these lay people like to say, well, money can't buy happiness. I got news for them. <laughs> if I'm going to be unhappy, I'd rather be rich and unhappy than poor and unhappy. <laughs> and for those who say money can't buy health, that's all right. If I'm going to be sick, I better be rich and sick <laughs> you know, than poor and sick. So... You can't win any of those arguments with me on money, you know. <laughs> the, the best thing about money is not what it can buy you, not mm-hmm. the toys that you get, right? but the freedom. Mm-hmm. See, um, the average person does not understand this until he moves into an income bracket. And at some point in his life, he'll realize what I'm talking about. But the guy out here working nine to five, he don't know what I'm talking about. But the guy that gets a break and goes in business for himself or makes the right move business-wise, and he's and and all of a sudden he finds himself making a lot of money. He finds that he's got freedom. Mm-hmm. Freedom, you can go places. You can take the vacations you want to go. You can visit places you never thought you'd ever be able to go before. You know? and it, it's not the toys, it's the freedom. Mm-hmm. And also, I mean, you know, there's a certain freedom that you have. I mean, we all have the, the freedom to say whatever the heck we want, but you have the freedom to be heard, right? I mean, the point is, is that we're sitting here talking to you partly because you've succeeded on such a grand scale, right? It takes a lot more ingenuity for people who don't have that money to be heard, right? So that's a, that's an expansion of your freedom in terms of the First Amendment as well. Yeah, I guess you would say that. But I, uh, you know, I speak to a lot of colleges and universities all the time, and I tell them how important their voice is, you know, and that they got to speak out. They got to be heard. And I invariably get back questions from the audience. Well, like, I don't have a microphone. I don't have a printing, printing press, you know. I don't have a newspaper, you know. I don't have a radio. Uh, so how, how can I get my uh, message out? 
I says, mouth. <laughs> Never shut up. Mm-hmm. Let well, people know how you feel. Well, and a lot of what you're talking about is personal responsibility, right? There's no excuses, right? No, you you can't go down that excuse road. You know, you gotta you gotta gotta, gotta get your message out. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Flint, and it's a pleasure to be able to help you share your message. And really, we just can't thank you enough for giving us the time and for allowing us into this amazing uh, office. Thank you. Well, there it is. That was the man. Mm. Uh, what a life, man. And, and, you know, um, and what a price to pay, you know, getting shot like that and being in a wheelchair. I, I love the fact that he, he was uh, describing money. It doesn't just buy you toys. It buys you freedom. <laughs> Which is ironic because he's in a wheelchair, but yeah. but you know, um, but like I, I like I like the one where he said he, uh, you know, he didn't he had all this money and he wanted to spend it. He didn't have anybody he felt <laughs> he was, deserved he, his he didn't money. Want to leave it. You know, hey, yeah. Larry, how about me? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it to good use. I'll, I'll open. I'll create a charity or something. Exactly. I'll, I'll maybe you should have hidden some of that in your beard, Mike. Did he, mention, did he mention your beard? He actually did when we were setting up the, you know, because I, I got the probably the closest to him as I was mm -hmm. leaning over his enormous desk. But uh, he had a whole bunch of uh, magazines of like all the uh, the different years that of the successful magazine. And 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 I'm leaning Porn, over, hustler, porno, I'm porno leaning, magazines. Hustler, I mean, you know, leaning, I loved Hustler yeah. when I was young. I'm leaning over the desk, and uh, and he goes, "Are you who listens to this podcast? A bunch of hippies." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, That's "And I said awesome. a million people listen to this podcast, but uh, no. What was what was for me? It was amazing just to have the opportunity to be in the room and to go upstairs and everything. But as I was, I'm, I'm, I am this bearded guy. I don't necessarily look like, you know, I'm coming in to record something, but I got my hands filled mm -hmm. with, with equipment and, uh, the security guard downstairs goes, you can't film in here. You can't record anything in here. And I'm like, but I'm, I'm going to see the guy who owns the building. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to yeah. do an interview with him. And then he goes, well, okay then. And I'm like, that's the level of security of the Flint building? <laughs> Are you serious? Well, well, okay then. I, yeah. mean, I mean, to be fair, I mean, you know, the, we had to go up to the ninth floor first. Right. And then they checked us in. We sign in. They phone up. They send us up to the tenth floor. And then you enter this weird room without a purpose, right, which is this little elevator lobby. And both doors are locked, right? Wow. And you have to pick up a phone handset and, like, call in. And then they buzz open the door. Well, you know, getting shot will probably we'll put, we'll put, uh, put your uh, yeah. eye on security. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty traumatic. Walking into this place, um, it is it is no office in a high rise building that you've ever been into in your entire life. I mean, really? this was I, you would almost feel like a chic owns this or something. <laughs> it was the the amount of um, oil based paintings, large oil based paintings, <laughs> gives this appearance that. Um, this room could buy me 15 times. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? Sure. Tiffany yeah. lamps just everywhere, beautiful and ornate. It's an oval office, right? Though yeah. this is a this is the lobby space that was prepared to obviously have a ton of people sitting down in different areas. I mean, mm -hmm. it was an amazingly furnished, ornate candelabra. The man has I taste. Mean, yeah. yeah. Expensive taste. Yeah, for sure. And with expensive taste that he I love the name Hustler. Like, Hustler's such a cool name for a magazine. I mean, it's just—it's almost like you can't—you can't hear the word hustler without, you know, thinking of something dirty. Well, I, they, the image every single time I hear hustler is of a girl spread eagle. You know, because remember back in—I'm well, old enough to remember when you got—you had Playboy and Penthouse. Those were hot magazines. But hustler, if you wanted to get serious, <laughs> if you were—if you were a professional masturbator, then you—you—you you, you got your hands on a hustler. So that thing was a piece of gold, man. Yeah. I mean, you saw it all. I mean, it was, it was even as a guy. I think the first time I ever saw Hustle, I was probably nine or eight, and I was appalled, <laughs> but very turned on. So thank you, Mr. Flint, for, for educating me on what a real woman looks like, man. Well, I've I, never lost my taste for a Hustler woman either. Well, I think that's the other interesting thing, too, is, you know, Hustler is also sort of, it's his the, the code that he lives by. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he's always been a Hustler, and there are, 
you know, it, there is an appropriate way to do things. You're not supposed to offend people. You're not supposed to get in people's face. And that's never what he's been about. And you look at that's, I mean, what he's talking about with the First Amendment, you know, that if you're not offending people, you're not really using the First Amendment. Like, that's right. the hustler mindset. You know? I love that. I, lo- I never thought of it that way. I mean, there's offensive speech and it's just trying to hurt people and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we all know that. And it's easy to ignore. But but I, I guess the uh, the First Amendment only really... I guess counts when it's quote unquote offensive, but but you have to add something to that sentence to somebody. Mm-hmm. So you know, my my thing about pornography has always been you know I'm friends with the porn director, and my friend my other friend was like, dude, well, why you know you're friends with the porn director? It doesn't look that good. I was like, hey hey bro, I'm not a hypocrite. I watch porn. Okay, mm-hmm. I watch porn right now. If I'm not going to be friends with the guy who produces that, then I'm a liar. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm never going to be a liar. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll be a lot of things, but I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Um, as long as I participate in what you're offering, <laughs> yeah, hey man, I don't. Maybe I don't want my kids doing it. Maybe mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't even want my kids watch. I don't know. I'm a hypocrite, and that's sense maybe but i'm i'm not going to shun somebody who's involved in the business and so in in that sense i think larry flint kind of came along and said hey everybody i know we do this in the closet mm-hmm. but uh but i'm going to bring it out in the open and we're right. going to have a discussion about it that's what makes our country a modern country mm-hmm. we are always having to contend with those questions mm-hmm. and i loved what he said about snowden and, and manning i mean he's right there are certain things the government does to keep us safe that we don't need to advertise. We don't mm-hmm. need to tell people everything. Transparency uh, as dogma is not a good thing. You know, not, not everything has to be transparent. It's irresponsible and dangerous. Don't tell everybody how to make a silencer, how to make a g- bomb, how to make a nuclear weapon. I don't want that. That's There are rules. There are laws. There should be laws. I always say to gun, gun nuts, look, I own guns. It's all good. But should we make poisonous snakes and machine guns just available on, over the counter? Counter? Not really. I don't mm-hmm. think so. Because it, it, there is a line where things start to, you know, affect other people, regardless of how you're exercising your rights. But um, he took on that good fight and paid a heavy price for it. But that's what's ironic about it. That's what's so cool about this country. Sometimes the loudest, gutsy, gutsiest guy, whether you like him or not, actually plays a large role in your continued freedom. Mm-hmm. You know? And I mean, that's the thing is, is that ultimately, you know, it goes back to I can't remember if it was there's there's a famous line that, you know, I may not agree with you, but I will die to defend your right that's to right. say what is disagreeable to me. That's right. And, you know, I mean, that's the thing is, is that Larry. Flint, that's the American way. Absolutely. And Larry Flint, you know, even though he doesn't even want to talk about Sarah Palin, like he has fought so that Sarah Palin can express her view. Right? Yeah, and he was very, very critical of Republicans. I think it was a little unfair. And from my view, you know, I've never met one who, was, who wasn't at least a little bit racist. Well, he said, well, he's, he's, he's a conservative. Yeah. conservative. Yeah. Conservative Republicans, and I think that's also the important distinction. Yeah. He's not talking about Republicans in general. Right. He's talking about a subset of Republicans who are you know, certainly in his and view, he comes from yeah. the south. Remember, and 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 you know, and I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, that that was just a very, that, and and I love that he said I don't feel comfortable saying it, but that's his truth. That's mm-hmm. how he feels, and that's by the way, there is an intelligent argument to be made for the fact that people who are very who are arch conservatives, as we would have it, social conservatives, etc., uh, have a religious conviction. But you could make the argument that a lot of them are bigoted in one way or another, as we all are. But that's an important conversation to have, you know. Um, well, it's his history, though. He yeah. personally has been in these very high-profile scenarios, mm-hmm. and he, in his heart and soul, comes from a place where he's just never been in the same room, the same presence with a guy you know, that that had the conservative Republican stance and wasn't a bigot. That's mm-hmm. a that's a very large statement. What I thought was interesting was that I had some something in common with him. I, I also am a fiscally conservative liberal. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, to hear him say that and be so successful. I mean, here's a guy who's 70 years old. A capitalist. He's a, yeah. a he's, free market guy. Absolutely. Right? And, he, and he's making more money yeah. than he ever has in the business because yeah. he went digital. I would love to understand more about 
you know, the competition between these industries, you know, or the, between the players in this industry. You well, know? I think that the competition was, you know, I think Playboy was considered always a little bit more classy or whatever, whereas P- Hustler was just more just raw, yeah, just raw, down dirt. Now well, it's tame, right? Even, well, it's technically savvy, though. I mean, he yeah. literally, the digital market, if you look into that franchise, that is just amazing really? what he's been able to do. Yeah. Oh, so he was the one who kind of, he, he, he was ahead he of the game. He jumped band- on that bandwagon. And, you know, that's the thing is, is there are a lot of people who, resisted that change mm. um i don't I look don't, the guy the yeah. guy by his own admission started out by saying i wanted to have fun and make money yeah and then and then this fight this first amendment fight was kind of thrust upon him mm-hmm. uh, which is often the case a lot of times if Absolutely. you look at you know a lot of historical figures and he is a, he is going to be a historical figure he will be somebody you bring up when you talk about the first amendment absolutely very important guy in the 20th century actually in that sense and uh you know, it, it, he he probably never expected in a million years to have to not only pay such a heavy price, but be thrust into that fight. Absolutely you not. Know? I was really taken with how clear mm-hmm. a thinker he was, and well, and, I, and how 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 a wonderfully sort of um, uh, I suppose complete his points of view were because they were so informed by thought. Well, and I think the interesting thing is is that, you know, his life has been lived on the extremes. Mm -hmm. And when you are forced to live on the extremes, you have to think clearly because, you know, your your thoughts are constantly challenged. Well, when a judge sentenced you to 25 years, think about that. That's that's a form of death. That's exactly Mm -hmm. like somebody saying you got terminal cancer, in Mm -hmm. in my opinion. 25 years, Mm -hmm. you know, we'll see you later, bro, when you got a Mm -hmm. white beard. You know, that that's that's a terrifying thing for anybody. So, yeah, it's kind of and then getting shot that's going mm-hmm. that's going that's a baptism of fire if ever heard and I, th- one. I think the other thing too is in terms of what mike was talking about you know he sees people i mean people w- by you know if you go into the room with larry flint you know all of your bullshit is coming out you know what i mean those deep dark prejudices are probably revealed by just by being with him so i think he probably sees a lot of human nature much more clearly than the rest of us do in a pleasant day-to-day interaction. Yeah, well, careful, you know. you're talking to a stand-up comic, so... Uh, <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> no, but I, I, know what I, know, I know what you mean by that. Um, th- that's the one thing that, I always, that always irks me, is whenever I feel like I'm in a room with somebody who's pretending to be way more upstanding than they are. Mm-hmm. I do think, though, that, that as I get older, there is a place for conservative... Well, I suppose restriction, self-restriction. I mean, you know, what's interesting is that we're we're kind of these we're caught between wanting to have a great time and wishing we could be more sexual than we are. But you know, really, uh, sex comes with a big price, um, and 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 it's not necessarily a religious or social price. It's it's look, it's you can get a disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, historically, you would die from those diseases. Well, historically, or, or you still can die from those diseases. You yeah. still can die <laughs> yeah. from those diseases. But also, you know, when you're, when you're working on a relationship, mm-hmm. when you have intimacy with somebody, when you have children with somebody, when you have responsibility for that person's well-being, you know, it's a natural, it's very natural for most people to, to be very jealous uh, uh, and, and, and very upset at the notion that the person you share a bed with that you've had children with is fucking somebody else. Mm-hmm. You well, know, um, I think that 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 tends to be that can be um, that's something that we have to contend with. That's that's a uh, that's that's part of the equation too, and a very truthful part of the equation. I think it is a, a where a lot of um, our current philosophy comes from. You know, our our religious philosophy and and our our um, you know just our even the way we structure our legal system. Think about divorce laws. Well, there's two really interesting things in what you've said, because you say a lot of interesting things, Damn because right. you're Brian Callen. Yep. Um, but the first thing is, is, you know, religion. If you really look at the Ten Commandments or any, you know, religious laws, what they're really all doing is they're all encouraging long-term thinking and punishing short-term thinking, right? right? You know, monogamy, fidelity, self-denial in a relationship, that leads to a long-term building of a relationship, cheating you know, is very short term and destroys something that could have grown into something else, right? Right. Theft as opposed to trade, you know, murder as right. opposed to reconciliation. Right. So, I mean, you know, r- the, but the other thing that I think that's interesting is you said, you know, self restriction, right? Yes. And I think that's the crucial thing is, is that, you know. But, but also, it also, self restriction belongs to a rational being. Mm-hmm. Our laws, I mean, our laws are, are predicated upon the fact that we are dealing with a rational 
populace. Mm-hmm. If you step outside the bo- outside the bounds of rationality, then you are no longer part of that populace, and you go to jail. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- that's why there are, there's a difference between laws. For example, you break where well, I come from such and such, and the traffic laws are different there. <laughs> okay, well, I'll give you a slap on the wrist and don't do that. And when you're in Rome, do as Rome does. But then there's uh, oh, I I uh, I took that woman's baby because I wanted a baby and uh, I killed her. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't care where you are, pal. Where where you know that doesn't that doesn't fly. Mm-hmm. In, in in this society or in any society mm-hmm. because we are rational beings and we are somehow in tune with a natural, universal uh, law and order. That's right. I'm, and that's where that's where uh, the the debate actually should 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 begin. That's that's where the that in some ways, in some ways is the rebuttal to you know these the rampant pornography or rampant uh, you know promiscuity and things like that. I think. But I think the interesting thing is is that d- is it the place of the government to restrict that, or is it is it is is commerce allowed to create those opportunities and then individuals have to choose whether or not they engage in that? I would agree with the latter. I mean, yeah. I think that you know it's it's a, allow commerce as commerce does, and then let people choose. That's why essentially I'm a libertarian. Yeah, I think that you know, I think it just makes sense. Maximum liberty. I, I just think give people maximum personal responsibility, not children, but you know, adults. Mm-hmm. Can Adult. I ask you something, Hunter? Yeah. How did you feel when you walked through those doors into Larry Flint's office? <laughs> well, I mean, the, I, I, the thing that's really interesting about uh, Mr. Flint is the degree to which. There is so much more going on underneath those seemingly calm waters than you would think. And I mean, from the moment we walked through that door, he was watching us. He was evaluating. He was checking things out. He was scoping things out. And actually, um, uh, Kim, uh, who brought us in and, you know, was there throughout the interview and made the introduction and all that sort of stuff. uh, She told an incredible story in the waiting room, which was that she had bought a fake watch right with fake jewels and all of that sort of stuff right and one day she's helping him and he she leans over him and he notices the watch and he goes oh that's a nice watch and then he runs his finger around the outside of the watch right and he mm-hmm. says but it's not real ah and that he, was excellent yeah and is he, that right and yeah and apparently and he said and she was like how did you know and he goes, well, because if it's real, when you rub your fingers across real diamonds, they're smooth. You don't feel anything. When they're fake diamonds, they're slightly That's rough. That's cool. You know what I mean? You know, it's like, it's like when you're 70 years old. My father, my buddy came in one time and he was like, blah, 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 blah. And he walked out, said three words. And mm-hmm. my father goes, what's that guy do? I go, he's a writer. And my father said, I suspect that's not going to work out for him. <laughs> and I said, I said, how'd you know? And my father said, pattern recognition. I've been around the block about 5,000 times. It was so great. Yeah. But didn't you say that there was a, uh, he had an assistant come in every seven minutes? Yeah, I mean, there was a gentleman that was actually sitting in, and again, when you, when you're, we were only able to be on one side of, I'd say a quarter of the building is what we mm. really saw from where we got through Which the Which you described as being in the shape of a... Vagina, <laughs> I think so. Keep going. Um, but, so we walked towards his office, his office is in the corner, and there was, everywhere you walk to, by the way, there's just chairs and, and little seating areas, like, I could imagine there being 30,000 people in here and, fe- mm-hmm. and feeling comfortable. Um but you walk over and there's a little waiting area outside of his his office doors and and he's got the double doors real elegant everything's really nice wood and and I'm just looking at this guy I'm like I don't know what he's all about I mean maybe he's just you know a security guy or an admin guy or something but he's sitting outside we walk in there's and he's a, built like a linebacker yeah, by the way I mean nice. I know just he's like big gentleman bursting and, out of a designer suit yeah. <laughs> you know? and you guys wore suits right yeah I mean for Mr. Flint you know we you were a suit. instructed you, you wear, wear a, a suit, suit for Mr. Flint but, yeah. yeah yeah so we walk in and uh, and there there's a meeting going on actually in the office so we're off to the side and I'm setting things up with the equipment and everything. And uh, and and as we got into the session, this gentleman who was waiting outside um, would come in um, almost every seven minutes. It felt like, and he would come in every just walking in this pace that was very controlled and purposeful. He had in his hand a tea cup. 
Mm. Uh, a serum, and, and, a serum, and, a truth serum. <laughs> and, and, and he would walk in front and place the teacup down. And, Goat and, blood. And then he would remove the old teacup mm-hmm. and, and ever so That's exactly what I do. If I had money like that, I would, have, I would have an assistant the, just bringing me stuff like, like, a, like a kitten to pet. Yeah, uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> Just presenting me with gifts and then sending the gift away like a Mont yeah. Blanc pen. No, not for me. Thank you. <laughs> the amazing thing was is that there I, there was at least two or three of those cups were never touched. Of they were, they were still But you replaced. know what? They were they ran cold blood clots. <laughs> uh, uh, it I was, love it. It was I amazing. It. I mean, and, he, and he had a he has a gold plated uh, wheelchair. Huh? Yeah, right. gold plated wheelchair. Yeah, we did. Wow. Um, and then also, I mean, the, the chandelier you, over oh, his yeah. desk he was ornate. Far out chandelier. Yeah. And like even when you the thing that I thought was really cool is when you walk out of the elevators, he has like these two giant maidens like you would find on the front of a boat. Damn. But they're holding these massive lamps, these oh, massive torches. The ladies of liberty, I That's call them. Right. <laughs> ladies of liberty. Yeah. I mean it was it was uh it, I, I I can't would, believe I was doing God and I love mm-hmm. Kirsty and I love doing the show, but I can't believe I was I was shooting a sitcom when you guys got to go, yeah, go you, talk to history. You w- you would have eaten it up. You really I, would have loved it. I the Mike Casentini Hunter Mott show at that point. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for usurping, but you did a great job. I felt privileged to be in that environment. Um, I would have to rank this as probably the highlight of my year. Mr. Flint, I hope you listen because you were the highlight of the Brian Callen show. There it is. Was it highlight of your? That it, yeah. is a, it is a marker. It kind of feels good when you, you know, when we we go out to start doing this podcast and somehow Hunter Motts hitches on and starts getting us a very high caliber, you know, clientele here. I mean, we've it's, it's Hunter's. I don't know. Hunter's just unbelievable getting yeah. people and and uh, but but um. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? It's kind of a nice marker where you think back and you go, "Dude, I'm in L.A. and I'm in Larry Flint's office right now." Well, you hit learning. the mar- you hit the mark when you said this is a guy of history. I mean, we this you're just not going to be able to speak about the 20th century and not include him in the conversation. Well, more importantly, we had a real you you know we had a chance. You guys had a chance to really talk to him too. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have a lot of time on TV with most most people. You have two minutes. Mm-hmm. Whereas whereas Larry Flint gave gave. 30 the show 30. 30 yeah and that that's pretty cool man and he was tight and he was i mean his his responses were so good and yeah. right it, it feels like it's hard for him to speak too it feels I, like he it's an effort for him you know so mm-hmm. in that sense you know it, it's it, a workout it's not, probably. it's not easy yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. i you know hunter so great jealous. job great job with the interview yeah. um we we went in there set things up in six minutes we're started, you know, recording. It was all on you, dude. You had to make sure that sound was good. Yeah, can you no, imagine? It was amazing. Can you imagine if the sound had been <laughs> like shitty. Hey, just there was no sound? <laughs> hey, Way uh, to go, Mike. That's Mr. a lot of pressure. Mr. Flint, can we do another take? Oh, <laughs> what did you, what did you, when you started hearing those the ambulance and the fire oh, department, God. what what were you thinking? Well, the thing, so he started that he started that response, right? Yeah, I, which I, I, was yeah. all about the racist Republicans, which you know whether you agree or not, it's just <laughs> such an epic line to get, and then right. all of a sudden the fucking ambulance ambulances excuse my friend show up that's and what they're happens like, right? they're, really? they're listening right now yes yeah, they're, they're right underneath the SWAT us. team the SWAT team helicopters yeah. bust through the, the window the conservative republicans sent them out yeah. just to like well look what's great about this country is you're allowed to say that without wor- not wor- yeah. you know, worrying about that if you were in Russia you would have to worry about that yeah. but we're not in Russia ladies and gentlemen what we're a beautiful in America what a beautiful view though too from oh, upstairs the view is epic I mean yeah. he's I mean, got this iconic building that's centered in, the, in, in mm-hmm. where you want want to be in Los Angeles, yeah. quite frankly, yeah. and you could see 300, if you had the opportunity to, to go all the way around that building, you're going to see all of Los Angeles. I love, the, I love the movie where he just, there's a, there's a shot in the movie where he goes, where can a pervert go and be left alone? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, man. Bam! Los Angeles, man. I had just moved, I think, when I saw that movie, so yeah. it was pretty it's wild. It's a great movie. Yeah. yeah. Great movie. Yeah, man. If you haven't seen it, go go watch The People vs. Larry Flint. It's actually an important movie and, and maps out how important this guy was and is. And um, and very enjoyable, too. I mean, it's a great movie. Oh, it's a great so movie. Fun. It's a great movie. Yeah. Woody Harrelson's unbelievable. I love that yeah. he said it was really, what did he say, painfully accurate or something? Yeah, and then he said that Woody I, Harrelson played me better than I played myself, yeah, I which love is that. such a great line. Uh, yeah, Woody, Woody is. Woody's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we'll get him on. I'm going to try to get Kirsty Alley on. Um, all right, guys. Well, I, I, anything else? I mean, I'm, I'm, I was very impressed. Thanks to both of you guys for uh, making that happen, covering my tracks. And um, 
And there it is, guys. I hope you learned yeah, something. Yeah, I'm hoping. I'm hoping we get a second, a second chance to talk with them again and bring bring you out this time. I'm huh? down. I, I would love it. I would yeah, love it. We'll, we'll knock amazing. on that door when we when we get a chance. Uh, but you guys did uh, did him and the show justice. I appreciate it. And uh, once again, I will be in Raleigh, North Carolina, at Good Nights. Um, and if you and check BrianCallen.com uh, for my dates because I got a lot of them coming up in September and October, uh, and I'm looking forward, especially October, and November. All right. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show. Be sure to visit briancallen.com for information about this episode as well as past and future episodes. You can follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Callen and like him on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash briancallencomedy. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.